I think a lot of men are trying to figure out like, what it, what does it mean to be a man nowadays, right? A modern man, especially in a space where it's like, you're kind of like the enemy. I mean, which is completely ridiculous to me. Now, so some men are getting soft because they're not using their bodies, right? Right. And it's like, you're meant to, right? You're meant to. As a man, we're meant to. And we are, we're so strong and resilient. And a lot of men don't tap into that. And we really only have a kind of short window where we're at our peak strength, you know, and that's like in your 20s and 30s, right? right. Our, tes our testosterone is super high in our early 20s. And once we hit 40, testosterone seems to trend down, but exercise can boost that testosterone and, and maintain that. And there's other things you can do to improve that. What misconceptions do you think that men have about women and even women have about men? Some guys feel like girls like the bad boys, you know, like. Oh, like, yeah, that's a misconception, too. Even younger men that are dealing with erectile dysfunction. And I think it is connected to like no exercise. A lot of it, I think like overuse of porn is also part, you know, huge part of it. Hey, everyone. Finally, we're here with Drew McGovern. He is an amazing person and an amazing healer, physical therapist. I'll let him tell you more about what he does and what his gift to the world is. I think all of us know that it's been pretty cold and lonely for men out there in terms of just being a man and what that's created in the body for men because the body does keep the score. And, you know, it develops high levels of anxiety, depression, erectile dysfunction, even in younger men. And so Drew's here to chat with us about what is going on in the world with men, uh, about men, with their bodies, how maybe you can recreate how you show up to the world because the world needs you guys. Please remember that, right, Drew? We need Absolutely. them. So, yeah. So, this is Drew. Drew, welcome. And, you know, tell us a little bit about yourself. Samira, thank you so much. First of all, uh, it's an honor to be here. You're amazing as well. So happy to talk with you. And, uh, yeah, talk about guys, talk about dudes and <laughs> men. Uh, we're, we're pretty awesome, you know, and yeah, we got to stick together and show the world, you know, that we're here and, uh, you know, we can take on a lot of things and then we can give a lot of love to people. So, yeah. So my name is Drew McGovern. I am a physical therapist professionally. I work currently full time on an Air Force base with the Special Forces unit. So I work Tuesday to Friday. And then I also work part time in the Army Reserves. Uh, I'm an officer in the Army and I'm a platoon leader there. I'm a physical therapist in the Army as well. And then uh, I do a little side hustle on the side that I help some of my private clients out with. So, you know, busy, busy life. I'm also uh, a dad to two beautiful children, Connor and Grace. Connor's one and a half. He's walking around being crazy. Grace is uh, <laughs> four years old and she's keeping us busy, but they're beautiful kids. And my wife, Teresa is amazing. She's a big support for all that I do, you know, through my time in service, you know, in the army and just uh, holding it down at home. And she's an amazing mother to, uh, watch her love the, the kids and me and my, in our family. It's, it's amazing. I work with a lot of men at work. So uh, <laughs> I have about 50 something guys that I work with and there's only about three or four females on base. So my days are filled with guys all day. And, <laughs> Sounds like my know, days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So <laughs> it's honestly the best job I've ever had currently working with the special forces. They're just awesome men all around. And their motto is that others may live. So mm. they really put all their focus into saving lives and saving others. And they, they take their jobs very seriously. And then when they see me for physical therapy, we kind of have like a humor performance optimization room. So I'm, I'm part of a team with an athletic trainer and a strength coach. We're a really good team. And these guys come in whenever they want. There's no insurance. They get their treatment. They they put their bodies through a lot physically, emotionally. They go through a lot of stuff as well. But yeah, it's been a blessing to be there to help them. And they tend to open up to us a lot because when they come into the treatment room, we want to make it like a barbershop, you know, and, yeah, and, yeah. and for a guy, like a barbershop is a pretty big deal. Like I know, like my wife, she goes to salons and that's a big deal for you women as well. And you know, you want to have the, the best like hairstyle and, you know, you kind of connect with your stylist. So in, in a barbershop, you kind of like let go and like say whatever you want and you just kind of BS and, you know, no, no judgment and everybody just kind of lets go. So it's a cool opportunity because they can let go and be themselves. And then we provide them treatment 
to help them feel better physically. Not only does that help them physically, but also emotionally. So it's a really cool environment, a cool setting. You know, the, the men there, they have to put on, you know, kind of a strong persona because their jobs are very physical right there in the, they're special operators. So they do a lot, you know, as far as tactical preparation. And then they're also EMTs. So they all, all know how to save lives and, you know, provide medical care at the highest level. And they do this in a combat environment. So, you know, they'll be coming in on a helicopter. They'll be taking fire. They have to deploy, usually typically be a parachute. They also go via boats, helicopters, airplanes, and they come in and, you know, they could be getting shot at actively, but they have to focus on, you know, saving whatever team mate that is on their team or that needs help. So yeah, they, they just basically put their bodies on the line all the time and the training is very intense. So, you know, you feel that in their bodies when I work on them. Wow. Yeah. So, you know, I do in physical therapy, I focus a lot on manual therapy, like, as you know, uh, hands-on healing and what is I the difference a, again? I know I always ask you this question because there's not a lot of people that do what you do. Sorry for interrupting you. That do what you do in the United States specifically, like what you do in terms of having helping the body heal itself and right. getting rid of those. Because I'm guessing these guys have really high levels of cortisol in their body with yep. all of this high anxiety demanding training as well as when they're actually on the job right so can you tell us a little bit about the whole manual thing because i know i always ask you questions about that and, uh, yeah absolutely it's so interesting yeah yeah i'll try to tell you my story i'm talking too much just interrupt me you know let me no, know no no uh, you're saying yeah yeah i just yeah. don't want to forget like like yeah they, for sure saying things and i'm like wait a second yeah that that's so important yeah. because if these guys i look at it like this right how can our audience relate to other men and what we're talking about and you especially also because you balance like so much and you still have such great energy that you give off and that you like love but yet you're also super masculine in a really like safe way as a person as a woman you know i'm sure like your wife and your kids and other people around you your patients all feel that from you because it's very obvious so when you're with these guys they kind of finally were able to like disarm you know, pun intended, I guess, yeah. with you. <laughs> and so, <laughs> and their bodies must be full of stress, which I feel like so many men out there are just walking around full of anxiety. And, you know, what can you share? Like, these guys have it. I'm sure you we've all dealt with it. Like, does your work, yeah. you know, help out? Absolutely. So going back to the manual therapy, kind of how I got into manual therapy. I went to Quinnipiac University. It's a PT school in Connecticut, Hamden, Connecticut. And it's an accelerated program, six and a half years. And on your last semester, you're given the opportunity to basically pick a course that you want, an elective course. So my electives that were presented were something called Mulligan, which is a type of manual therapy. And then this other course called Osteopathic Manual Therapy. And I had no idea what it was, and I was pretty intrigued by it. When we walked in the class, the professor basically called up a student. It was a female, and he brought her to the front of the class, and she laid on a table, and she kind of put his hands on her very gently near her feet, and he wasn't saying anything. He was just examining her. And as students, we're like, what's this guy doing? You know, he's <laughs> yeah. like, he's not talking. <laughs> like, he's just like touching this girl's he's legs. Touching the girl's feet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're like, all right, what's happening? Like, mm, okay. But but then it was amazing. He was able to, by feeling her body, he was able to sense the trauma and the injuries that she had in the past. And he mm. basically like listed all these injuries that were accurate up to the date of her injury. Like when she was eight wow. years old, when she was eight years old, she fell off a swing set and hit her head. And she was like, yes, I did that. You know, when you were 13 years old, you sprained your ankle playing soccer. Yes, I did that. And we were like, this is, this is like magic. Like what, what is he doing? So anyways, it was yeah. emotional for her. She ended up crying because he kind of went through her body and felt this tension. So immediately I was very yeah, intrigued right. and I was very interested. Right. So then fast forward right. a couple of weeks later in college, I played rugby and rugby is a very physical sport. So a lot of tackling, very physical. I was uh, in the front line, which is basically where you, you tackle. It's called a hooker. So I was in the middle. And every time you engage, you know, your, your neck's getting hurt, your shoulder. So I was getting injured a lot. And on one tackle, I tackled this guy head on. And one of my vertebrae basically dislocated and Ooh. to the point where I was unable to, to turn my neck. And I was in a lot of pain. So I went to this professor of the osteopathic manual therapy and he said, Drew, sit on the table. So he had me sit on the table and he had his hand on my head and was just like, here, push here, push here very gently. 
Yeah. And then I could, I could feel my spine align and I was able to turn my head fully, no pain. So at this moment, I was like, I want to know what this guy knows, right? So right. long story short, I took a lot of interest in this course. I did really well. At the end of the course, he said, hey, I think you have a good skill set. Do you want to work for me? So that was the, I said, yeah, absolutely. So that was my first job out of school. There were all the cool connections. This guy, Stephen Moran is his name. He works out of Columbia, Connecticut, Crossroads Physical Therapy. So anyways, uh, my wife, Teresa, she also worked with me with that job. So we both worked together at this clinic. And every Friday, Stephen would take about two hours to train us one-on-one and would show us all these awesome techniques. And we were treating young children as young as, you know, six weeks old, all the way up to nine, you know, all the way up to 90 year old adults. So I was getting a broad range, but with this type of manual therapy, osteopathic manual therapy, it's a very holistic way to look at the body. So how Steven teaches it is, and this is how I preach it and teach it and follow it as well, is when you're working with an individual, you look at the physical, the emotional, and the spiritual side of the being that you're working with, right? And how we look at it is that the spiritual circle. So if you look like at a Venn diagram, you got the three circles, the spiritual Mm -hmm. circle and inside the spiritual circle is your emotional and physical. So you can tell a lot about a person by their spirit, right? So like you have a great spirit, you, you bring off a lot of positive energy, right? And you can kind of see that in somebody, but when somebody's spiritually broken, it's really hard to heal physically and emotionally. So, you know, I like to pump everybody's spirit up when I see them and that could be like connecting with them and what they like to do. Like, what's your hobby, right? Like, you know, like you like to travel. I like talking to you about your travels. Mm -hmm. Some people find spiritual strength through religion, right? We could go into, into that realm, but it's really like what makes your spirit thrive? You know, is it being with people, you know, whatever. So anyways, that's something I kind of, hint on with everybody because it's so important to boost their spirit up so they can feel better emotionally and physically right so the the cool thing about osteopathic manual therapy is when you work with somebody's body and you tap into it and you focus you can feel where there's restriction the most common areas that i find in people that are stress high stress high anxiety usually in their neck and their upper traps Um, a lot of people you know work at desks nowadays and The neck holds a lot of tension, right? The neck's really important for us anatomically and physiologically because it houses a lot of our cranial nerves. So our cranial nerves are important for a lot of emotional and social engagement, right? So our facial nerve, we use to smile, to cry, to laugh, you know, to talk. Right now we're we're, we're talking. There's also other important cranial nerves that have to do with hearing and taste and touch and and all this, right? So these nerves are housed in their upper neck. So a lot of times when people are tight around the base of their skull or their neck, usually their Mm -hmm. cranial nerves get a little more jazzed up. So you feel like a sympathetic overdrive. So you're, you're, you know, you're living on cortisol, you're you're living through stress, your eyes are kind of wide, you're kind of like scanning your environment because when you're stressed, it goes back to survival. So you want to kind of take in your environment. So your eyes get wide, you're taking a lot in and, you know, you can tell a lot about somebody's upper neck and their tension in their head by the level of stress they have, you know, and then anytime that our body gets injured, our fascial system, our connective tissue, you know, like our muscles, our, our, our ligaments, our skin, it kind of gets tight as well. So, you know, a classic sign, you can see somebody and their kind of shoulders are rounded, they're hiked mm-hmm. up. Uh, their arms are their arms are crossed when you're talking to them. They're very um, guarded and guarded and protected. And a lot of times, you know, guys will be kind of like putting on a like a tough show, and no, yeah, you know, no. they'll kind of like p- pump up and like you know try to protect. But that's a sign of you know they're either protecting or guarded or not open yet because you know you just met them. But yeah, right. try to basically open up the the whole body, let the body breathe. Mm-hmm. Breathing mechanics are super important shoulders down away from your your head it kind of opens up the blood flow into your head and neck and you think more clearly and then you feel a lot more relaxed so there's a ton i do as far as like hands-on work a lot of different techniques you know the one thing that's cool that i learned some called craniosacral therapy oh my god yes and you did that to me the other day that for the first it, time was that the first time that you th- that yeah that was one of the first times we kind of did a longer like time of that type of treatment okay yeah wow um, and it was a Relaxed. It was you... like completely. Yeah, I, I it was very relaxing, and 
and it, but it, it was like on another level relaxing because I'm usually always very relaxed on the table and then as you're working through things and kind of realigning and opening things up obviously like you know we're having a conversation or whatever and but this was like something completely different that I hadn't experienced before yeah so when you do craniosacral therapy you're trying to find a balance mostly with the parasympathetic nervous system so quick rundown of that for everybody out there you have your autonomic nervous system, which is your central nervous system that governs everything. So think about your brain and your spinal cord. That's the central nervous system. And then there's nerves that branch out from your your CNS, your spinal cord, your brain. There's two, two sections of your autonomic nervous system. You have your parasympathetic, which uh, layman's terms is you're resting and digesting well. All right. So rest and digest, parasympathetic. Then your sympathetic is fight or flight. Let's go. I'm ready. Let's go. Let's fight. You know, bring it on. Mm-hmm. All right. Right. So right, right. most I'm of in people, I'm, like in I'm in danger. danger. Yeah. Right. Help me. Alarm you know, bells. I'm, I'm not yeah. sleeping well. I'm anxious. I have depression, you know, so most people live in that sympathetic state. And the cool thing about craniosacral is you tap into the parasympathetic and mm. craniosacral, the word, the head and the sacrum. So the parasympathetic nervous system lives mostly in the cranium region, which I talked about the cranial nerves, and then your sacral, sacrum region, which is where your sacral plexus is. So those are really important nerves down there. So basically how it's taught is your head and your sacrum communicate with each other, all right? So as we breathe in during inhalation, our head tips back and our sacrum tips down. So it goes into something called flexion. So the head and the sacrum do this. All right. And then when you exhale, they do the opposite. And there's this cool kind of pumping mechanism that happens from your tailbone all the way up to your head. And it pumps cerebral spinal fluid, which is basically the lubrication. It's a beautiful untouched fluid in our body that gets pumped out from our brain all the way through our spinal cord. And I think I mentioned this to you in the session, they studied this release of cerebral spinal fluid. And they're showing that people that are anxious or depressed, their cycles, normal cycles of this production of fluid should be six to 12 times a minute. And people that are anxious or depressed, they're looking at like four, less than six times a minute. So it's very slow and kind of groggy and depressed. So you want that rhythm to increase so you're getting good nutrients, you know, into your brain, your spinal cord. But yeah, like you said, it's very relaxing. I've done it on, you know, professional athletes through the military and the guys that are high stress, they get off the table. They're like, dude, like, I feel like I'm yeah. tripping. Like, what What did you I do? I want more. Yeah, yeah, I want more. They feel like they want to sleep, right? And that's a really good mm. sign because they're, mm. they're shifting out of that stressful state. They're calming down. They're breathing better and their bodies feel more open and relaxed. So I found really profound results from doing that and you know i can tell pretty quickly by touching someone if they need it you know so that's crazy how you can just touch the body and see i mean i feel like we we, we're so blessed that people allow us like i feel like that with my clients when they share things intimate things about their life right so like wow thank you for trusting me and for sharing and i guess i'm guessing for you it's the same because you know you deal with people and what they're dealing with and how it's held in the body and how to and you help them release it so they build a bond with you as well and it's uh, i just feel like so it's a gift that people allow us to do that would you say that because i mean it is incredible if someone maybe doesn't have access to someone like you or what is something that they can do at home or to kind of get that spinal fluid flowing better before they're able to maybe see someone who can, a practitioner or someone who could actually assist them with that. Yeah. Is there anything they can do on their own? Absolutely. There's a cool uh, technique. It's called the melt method, M-E-L-T. Pretty simple. All you need is a foam roller. Foam rollers are pretty common nowadays. And if you don't have a foam roller, you just use the floor or you could use like a bath towel, roll it up, you know, kind of long ways. And you're going to lay on that on the floor on your spine. And just that little pressure of the towel or the foam roller on your spine, that's going to mm-hmm. tap into the nerves around the spine because our body's designed really cool in a really cool way. So the sensory nerves, so what we feel and like we feel temperature and a breeze and, and pressure that typically comes from the backside of our spinal cord. So it's called the dorsal mm-hmm. horns. All right. 
And then what we do for motor skills, we do a lot of things in front of us. We reach for things, you know, we're turning, we're looking in front of us. The mm. nerves in the front of our body are our motor nerves, right? So it's a cool design because we don't have eyes in the back of our head. So if somebody's coming from behind us, we kind of sense that, right? You can sense it. Mm. Or like, yeah, somebody, yeah, yeah. Somebody, like, so, yeah, like, what, what, who is that, right? But yeah, if, look, I feel, <clears> yeah, yeah. Like, like I sense it, right? So that's your sensory nerves. So by giving your sensory nerves a little feedback with the towel, the foam roller, you're already tapping in the parasympathetic. You're basically showing your body, hey, I'm giving you a little compression. Uh, compression we like as humans because it calms us down. Like it's uh, an example is like somebody gives you a nice good hug. Like, you know, yeah. the great huggers out there, you're like you feel you feel warm. You feel like loved, you know. Same thing like in that in that fetal position, when you go into that cross position, you're you're compressing. So you're. You're, you're trying to feel safe, essentially. Or those heavy, like, blankets, right? Like, those heavy blankets. blankets. Yeah. Or, like, the babies, right? When you re- swaddle when you baby. swaddle them, right? Yep. So, it all comes from the same thing. It all comes from the same part of our nervous system. And this goes back, like Got you it. said, to when we were babies. So, anyways, you know, lay on the ground. Keep your arms open, palms to the sky, right? And mm-hmm. you're going to do something called 3D breathing. So, three-dimensional breathing. So, the... the Easiest way to understand it, you're you're gonna take three deep breaths front to back. So you're gonna try to fill your belly, your diaphragm, front to back. All right. So think about a balloon. You're just filling that, you know, from the front all the way into the floor. You do three breaths like that. The next mm-hmm. dimension, you're breathing laterally. So you're breathing side to side. So try to expand your ribs out to the side. Oh all right? wow! I just yeah. So you can uh-huh. you kind of tap in. All right, and then yeah yeah. The other, the third dimension is top to bottom. So imagine like you're a cylinder and you're pushing air into your head all the way down to your toes. Okay. All right. So, so visualization is important here, right? V- visualization is important because it allows you to get out of your stress state, it allows you to focus on your breath, which our breath can be used to really calm ourselves down. Um, it's a, it's a vital thing that we have that we're born with. And it keeps us alive. We need oxygen to, to live. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So your brain, you know, taps into that and feels comfort through that. So tell people to look up the melt method. There's a lot of cool videos on that. Okay. And then there's also something that's cool on Amazon. It's like 22 bucks, 23 bucks. It's called a still point inducer, S-T-I-L-L. And the still point inducer looks like, honestly, like breasts. It looks like two like little, little mouths. <laughs> they're like, they're like red. Okay. They're, like, they're like little, little like comfortable, like, you know, they look like nipples essentially. Boobies. Yeah. yeah oh, they oh, look nipples. like boobs. Oh, okay. Yeah. They look like, but it, it replicates like if you had two tennis balls, you tape two tennis balls together. And okay. this is really cool because this device helps induce a still point. There's a point where your body becomes still. And it feels like it's in a balanced state. And that goes into the spinal cord into your head. So you put the still point inducer. There's directions on there. But you put it on the back of your skull. So if you feel the back of your head, there's like a big bump there. Uh-huh. There, oh, that's yeah. called, there's called the external occipital protuberance. So you want to put the uh, nipples basically on the side of that, <laughs> uh, the side of that bump, right? Okay. And the cool part about that is right, right behind that bone, or actually right in front of that bone, it's something called the fourth ventricle. The fourth ventricle houses some of that cerebral spinal fluid. So you're giving your, your body a little feedback where that fluid is housed and it causes a stillness in the body. And as you lay there, you know, your headaches go away, your, your thoughts kind of calm down. You feel more at peace, more still. It's a really cool, easy device to use. And that's a great way to do craniosacral on your own. And you do yeah. that in conjunction with the towel? So you yeah. put the towel from here to the bit, so the spine, right? The and spine, yeah. The 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 nipples, the still, yep, yep. Nipples. still point inducer, yeah. <laughs> the still point inducer, <laughs> yep, yep. In the back, and that mimics sort of like what you do if someone isn't have like access to someone like you, or because it, exactly. it's not right. There aren't a lot of practitioners that do what you do in the United States. If if you're somewhere else, then yeah, I guess depending on where you're watching this or listening yeah, it's to a- it. It's a shame. You could find an osteopath like on every corner in Israel or if you mm-hmm. go to Europe, right? In European countries, osteopaths are very common and they do a lot of hands-on techniques. Unfortunately, in America, there's more incentives on like prescribing medication and, you know, a little more of a hands-off approach. So when yeah. you go to medical Treating school- symptoms, right? Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So 
mo- all DOs basically go through a type of hands-on training or they're given the option to learn it, but a lot of them don't do it. There are some that do do it. And if you're interested, you go online, you could look up, it's called Cranial Academy. Mm-hmm. So if you type in cranialacademy.org and you go to find a practitioner, you just plug in your zip code and then no. um, uh, an osteopath will pull up, you know, and close to your zip code. So the other problem is it's not always achievable for people because it's very expensive. So right. a lot of these osteopaths are, you know, hundreds of dollars, some 400, some 600, depending on where you're located, because a lot of times insurance doesn't cover it. Right. Which goes back to the model, the medical model that we have yeah. in this country, which is just treat symptoms instead of really getting at the root of things. Exactly. So yeah, it's kind of frustrating, but there are options in America. You just have to either hear about it through somebody or, you know, get lucky to come across a practitioner that does it, you know? Yeah. I was lucky to yeah. meet you because, so this is yeah. and how we met is I had TMJ from my stress and I felt like I looked like a pit bull. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. It, at least it felt like it, you know. <laughs> and then I went to NYU to the dental school, and I got so lucky with Doctor. He stayed like forty-five minutes on a Zoom call with me, like a telemed. And he sent me. He, I said, I want to try to do it as natural as possible. And he sent me to you. And then mm. I had I got to meet you, which was like what three years ago? Two years ago? Yeah. Three years ago? Three years ago, probably. Yep. It was during the pandemic. Yep. I remember because we had to wear masks. Yes. <laughs> so for a long time, I only knew this much of Drew. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I always saw your eyes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, bo- both of us were like this. Yeah. Yeah, so maybe we could talk a little, because it, it, I don't know, I just feel like you have so much to offer. When I'm with you, I learn so much. I mean, I know we mess around and, you know, talk a lot about like funny stuff or whatever, but I, I really feel that you have so much to offer because I do see men, you know, with like a lack of connection and there's a lot of loneliness and, and that's in the numbers, you know, and the numbers of suicides and I've experienced uh, losing someone to suicide. And unfortunately in that particular case, it was this particular mother's second son lost to suicide. So for me, this could be this could save some, these conversations can save someone's lives. Like if you're out there and you're feeling lonely, if you're feeling anxious, if you're feeling overwhelmed, if you're feeling like, I just feel like men are disenfranchised at the moment and it just doesn't make any sense. It doesn't, it does the the model, just like the medical model that doesn't make sense is not, you know, the problem. And so I just want to find ways that we can get this information out to men to create community and support and just let them know that they're not alone. Like you're not alone out there. There are a lot of men who are feeling this way. You get to probably see that through their bodies. Whereas I get to actually get it verbally, you know, just really like inside of their heart, inside of their mind, what they're dealing with. And and this whole idea of this touch starvation, I don't know how much you know about this, but the people are literally starving. And this is women and men for just touch and connection. Mm. And I was asked a question the other day, what is my superpower or a trait that I would would never want to like that I love about myself? And I think it's like my ability to connect with people. I think it's brought me so much joy and so much love and just just so many beautiful experiences because I'm able to connect with people. And I'm wondering if you have any particular because you're really good at that, too, Drew. Hmm, you really nice. are. Like you Thank have you. a way of making people feel really comfortable right away. And you just, you can feel the concern when I was sharing with you about the pain and the headaches that I was dealing with. And, and I, I really, I felt that you felt me and that you got me in that moment, even if, it, you know, mm-hmm. you know, even if we just met. And so because there's so much going out th- on out there, I think men are living in a world where they have a lot of the unrealistic expectations, whether it's from women, family, society. And I think a lot of men are just muted and not able to self-express themselves and all of that leads to a lack of connection i think sometimes there's a lack of connection with themselves which is i think part of everybody's journey right is there anything or you could share about your own life like because i think a lot of men are trying to figure out like what it, what does it mean to be a man nowadays right a modern man especially in a space where it's like you're kind of like the enemy I mean, which is completely ridiculous to me. And and even I, I work with men and I've had women, really crazy feminists, also get like upset at me, literally. Like they're like, you know, why do you want to help them? Like, why don't you work with women? It's just like, well, 
I enjoy working with men. I think that men are very coachable. Is there anything that you can really think of that can help? You know, I'm thinking about young, young men out there. I, I like a lot of, like you said, a lot of the curvature of the spine, which, you know, maybe comes from like the cell phones and the type of lifestyle that we lead. But I think it also says a lot about how they feel about themselves. And I see it in the younger men, like boy, young, I mean, teenagers that sometimes I chat with on the street that are eager to just be seen and heard because... I think I read somewhere like the worst thing to be is like a group of teenage boys because everybody's assuming that you're up to no good. Yeah. And so I just think like, yeah, like to, to come into a world like that, I have a little brother and I sense that in his body as well. Like what is something that we can offer our young listeners and even people who are just dealing with this whole like being in a shell of their body and like you said, it, it's connected to anxiety. Yeah, no, I, well, first of all, I think it's awesome that you like working with men. I think that, being able to talk to a woman that's basically empathetic towards men and, and able to, you know, get to our level and feel comfortable talking to you, that says a lot about you. And I think it's awesome what you're doing. So I think what you're doing Thanks. is needed for men to feel that support, you know, because, you know, talking about society as a whole, it seems like social media really has impacted. I feel like some men that are on it, not all men do it. I, I don't like to go on that much, honestly. There's a lot of soft men out there, right? So what I mean by that is, you know, men that either treat women the wrong way or they're not supportive husbands or not supportive fathers. And some men get influenced by that possibly through social mm -hmm. media. And I, I think that, you know, first of all, you got to cut that and quit that. It seems like a lot of stuff on social media is portrayed in a fake way. And I don't think that's good to be a strong man, to follow that type of stuff. But it's hard to figure out what's true and what's not. And then exactly you know, that's like, for the younger people, especially, you know, for the younger people. Right. So they're, they're so influenced by that. A lot of times it's how you're brought up, you know, the type of household you come up in. How is your father? How is he uh, with with your mother? Stuff like that. And I feel like, you know, now that I'm I'm a younger dad, I look to my dad because he I feel like he did a really good job growing us up. You know, it was a man of a few words, but he mm -hmm. was very strong and very loving towards my mother. And mm -hmm. that's something that I'll always see and, and love about him is how much he put his, you know, my mom first. It was always, you know, don't interrupt mom when she's talking. It was always like, you know, show your mom, tell your mom that you love her. Always be there, be appreciative, say thank you, say please, you know, connecting that way. So I think starting as a young man in your house, respecting your mother figure, and then hopefully if you have a strong father following in his footsteps, because then it just goes through generations and generations. If we have strong dads stepping up, being good people, being the example, setting the example, you know, acting in a way where your children visually see you doing good tasks, good deeds, you know, that's going to lead to a better society rather than following social media which I think can lead you down kind of a, a fake kind of soft lifestyle. But as a man, I think we like communities that support us in what we do. What I mean by that is, you know, for me personally, I was always an athlete. So I've always been drawn to like an athletic kind of community. And, you know, I do golf league occasionally now every Tuesday. So I go out with the guys and like, you know, we play nine holes of golf and we just talk about, you know, stuff that guys talk about. We connect that way, mm -hmm. you know, so little things like that. I think if you find, you know, a little time in your week to just connect with a couple other guys, you know, go out, do what you like, what makes you happy. I think that connection is really important because, you know, having a strong guy friend is awesome because, you know, they're going to tell you like, like they see it, they're going to be real. And uh, you want a good guy friend that's like going to tell you when you're messing up, when you're doing good in both bad and good things so yeah like someone who's going to hold you accountable and it's interesting what you're saying because a lot of I, what i think happens and then this is what gets put out there in social media and then it puts like the genders against each other now obviously i'm talking about heterosexual couples in this case which is what i usually deal with and on the male side and you know they'll have a bad relationship because they picked like we probably all have at some point the wrong person and I, it, one of the key things that I always tell them, like, okay, you learn something from that, like what doesn't work for you, what you don't want. But instead of avoiding women altogether or avoiding or, or just getting jaded and carrying that around, you know, thank people, 
you know, blame them gracefully in a way, but thank them because it gave you the opportunity to learn something about yourself, what works, what doesn't. And I think what's key, like with, with Teresa, for example, you know, your wife and other people, I say, when you choose someone who encourages you to go and spend time with your male friends or, you know, your communities, like whatever it may be. I, I read an article the other day that said that men need two days a week of that, of time away with their group community, group, friends, whatever it is. And you need to have a partner or that supports that, that knows that you're, you come home better when you have that and vice versa as well. Right. But, it, but this was a specific article about men needing at least two days a week to do that, which I was like, wow, not even one, two. Okay. It was, it was, it was interesting. No, no, no. But I mean, it, I, I get it because like you have to remember who you were because you have all of these responsibilities. And even if you don't have children, you probably have work or a job. And even if you're younger, you have the responsibility of trying to find your, your place in the world as a man, which it's not easy. And under these particular environment, this particular hostile environment towards men, I think it's become really difficult. And I sense it in, in when I see men's body language, you know, I read a lot of body language when I, and the things that they say, and, and I just realize that it's tough. So I think a supportive partner is key. And so it, to like to do what you said, to be able to go out a couple of days a week or at least once and just be yourself and just be supported by other men and just shoot the shit and have fun and whatever, you know? Absolutely. Like, like you said, like a supportive partner is key. Like Teresa will know and I'll ask her like, Hey babe, I just got to go work out for like 30 minutes. Cause I just, you know, I just need yeah. that because working out for me is really important. It clears my head. It makes me feel like myself. She's totally cool and supportive of that. You know, it's a little harder with kids because you we spend a lot of time trying to be with the kids. I, I really try to be present when I'm home. There's months where I'm not home as often, so I try to really be present when I can. Right. But even if it's, a, if it's a quick run, I'll take the kids in the jogger, you know, we'll just go for a, a jog. But she's super supportive in that way. She knows that's what I need. And, you know, yeah. it, it is. And you're going to be yeah. better when you come home, you know. I'm going to be better for, for, it. for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, maybe we could talk a little bit about working out because, I mean, there are people out there that, you know, I also always played sports when I was younger. So for me, it's also a place that when, for whatever reason, I fall off of it for whatever, it just, it really affects me. It affects my mental health. It affects the way I feel about myself, my energy level, the way I sleep, everything. But like, let's say for our listeners out there who weren't athletes, what, you know, I always suggest to them, get on the mat, do some sort of martial art because everybody starts from zero there. And I feel that martial arts, anybody can be good at them because it's so difficult to get good at it that everybody starts in an even playing field because I think a lot of it is in their head. Like, oh, I'm not, I'm not athletic. But I think that all of us have something that we could do physically because the benefits are just so great. Like, so do you have any suggestions for that? hundred percent. Martial arts you spoke about, I think it's great. It's a s strong discipline. I've tried Taekwondo and Kakundo different forms of self-defense martial arts uh, i also was a wrestler and right. there's something about martial arts wrestling like it's you don't have to be super athletic with like ball sports like throw a ball with a catch mm -hmm. but it gets you it gets you in tune with your body no matter where you start from if you're starting mm -hmm. like at a non-athletic state you know you're not that physical it focuses on moving your body in kind of holistic ways where you're you know, you're using your hips, you're using your arms, you're using your core. And that's really good for our nervous system because it basically allows us to step away from our, our world, our day to day, and allows us to focus and get into what's called like a flow state where, you know, mentally you're kind of just focusing on the next move. You're focusing to your instructor, your sensei, whoever it may be. And your you're breath, just, your you know? breath. Yeah. You're focusing on the, the you're instructions. Like to of the Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you get gas and like you're doing cardio, right? You're doing cardiovascular endurance. You're strengthening your, you're going against resistance against another person. Mm -hmm. So I think it's beneficial in all realms. Martial arts is a great, it's a great way to, you know, work your body physically. Um, and then just and it, like, there's a great community too, you know, because like with the martial arts, like wherever I travel to any country, I can always find my community. And so this is another reason I always suggest it to people because you don't have to really you know, and people tend to be very friendly because we know how, how hard we work at it, you know? So. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. 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 The community is huge and you're, you know, you're kind of in the class with everybody going through the same stuff. You're struggling together. You're winning together. You're losing together. Mm -hmm. So 
Yeah, I think it's it's awesome. I mean, another cool option, I did CrossFit for a while. CrossFit gyms have a good, strong community sense to them. And um, the cool thing about CrossFit is you can go in not knowing anything about lifting. You know, the instructors will teach you. And then everybody's super supportive. You know, they'll mm. they'll wait until your workout's done. You may be the slowest person there, but they're they're standing there pumping you up, yelling. You know, and there, there's other ways. Yeah. You know, like Orange Theory Fitness is a good outlet, but uh, those those can get pricey, right? You know, you right. can just like go on a hike. You can go on a bike ride. There's a lot of cool like movement, right? Like movement, a dance yeah. class. Like I always recommend dance classes also for the guys that like seem to have trouble uh connecting to their like their their sensuality and women because i always tell them like you're going to learn a skill that is good for your cognitive reserve you're going to learn a skill that women like to you know that gets you physically close to women not that you're going to do anything inappropriate but just just to like have that physical proximity to women if they don't have a lot of experience with women and also it just there's something about dancing and music and you know like somatic movements that i think is also really you know important for all of us really like it kind of connects us to ourselves yeah well. man, music's amazing like as you're dancing to music like, I mean, think of songs, right? You hear a song, like, like you haven't heard a song in like 10 years and then it comes on mm. and like, you remember the lyrics. There's something cool about music is like, it taps into your memory. It, it, it it's, uh, taps in the right side of your brain actually. And it, it's that artistic side and it kind of gets the juices flowing for your whole system. And, you know, music's very healing. It's very therapeutic as well. And if you can dance with a partner, if you connect with a female like partner and you're moving with her. And you're feeling her body move. And then like, that's, I mean, that's a big connection there. Yeah. It's a dialogue, uh, you know? Yeah. It's, you could speak without speaking essentially. Exactly. So yeah, I think I'm a big supporter of fitness. I'm also a strength and conditioning specialist. So I really mm. value strength and conditioning and the whole fitness realm and the idea of staying fit. You know, we only have one body and we have to kind of treat it in a great way. And, you know, fitness can prolong your life. It can make relationships. It can build relationships stronger. It can clear your mind. It can do, I mean, there's so many positives to it. The list is endless, but, um, but yeah, it, it, I think going back to how some men are getting soft because they're not using their bodies. Right. Right. And it's like, you're meant to, right. You're meant to, as a man, we're meant to, and we are, we're so strong and resilient. And a lot of men don't tap into that. And we really only have a kind of short window where we're at our peak strength, you know, and that's like in your twenties and thirties, right? right. Our, tes our testosterone is super high in our early twenties. Once we hit 40, testosterone seems to trend down, but exercise can boost that testosterone and, and maintain that. And there's other things you can do to improve that. But this comes up a lot in the uh, military world. The men I deal mm. with, a lot of them are mm. concerned about the testosterone levels. So I'm knowledgeable on that. A lot of them want to get tested to see where their testosterone's at. And they're right. also very competitive. So right. if some share like, hey, my number was this, well, my number was that. And they'll be yeah. like, if, oh, if, okay. if their number was higher, you know, it's like a competitive thing. But they compete about everything. And that's just kind of the, the nature of it. Going back to testosterone, like in your 20s and 30s, you should try, try to use your body to the fullest. Like put it through the ringer like. You know, try a marathon, try different races, you know, try different competitions. Because at that point, as a man, our body, our bodies are capable a lot more than we think they are. And we can put our mm. bodies through a lot. And that's, that's a lot of mental strength as well. Right. And builds resilience and all this. Because what I get a lot of is like a lot of men who are not very resilient. Yeah. And, and any little setback or someone doesn't ghost them or someone doesn't talk to them or someone... And it's like, it's the, it just seems to be so impactful. And I don't know. I, I mean, I've been through a lot in my life. So I just look at that like, really? Like, is it really? I mean, of course, I'm supportive. But I, I you know, I push them to build resilience through failure and rejection, which is like, for some people, it's just like, they would rather not date than to be rejected. And it's like, you know, so I, I feel like, yeah, the resilience is low. The the, the, there's a lot of passive men out there and I just don't feel like that's your nature naturally of course there are men who are more competitive than others and and whatever but I think in general even the most le least competitive man or whatever and I don't like to get into that alpha and all that crap I think it's bullshit yeah. and I, I I yeah I, I I think you and I have spoken about that before right like mm -hmm. I just I don't like when they say oh but the alpha I'm like listen labels don't work you are your your own person the reality is 
that yes, yeah, some of us might lean towards something or some way or, you know, personality wise or whatever, but we can create our personality any way we want. You know, this idea that you're born like a specific thing, I think it's just an easy way not to really put in the hard work, you know, like David Goggins says, right? Stay hard. <laughs> the whole thing. Yeah, I love yeah. it. His book was yeah. amazing. Like he went through so much shit and I feel like, yeah, like you said, people are not tapping into the resources and I'm seeing it, like I said, with these men who are just so passive. And, you know, they're mit trying to mitigate risk in every situation instead of just putting themselves out there. Is there anything that you can suggest uh, aside from definitely pushing their body physically, even if they've never worked out or if they are, you know, if they have worked out or they played sport, maybe going back to it would help a lot with anxiety and, and like you said, mental clarity and, and just like, I feel like it, when you're working out, like you, you get organized with everything else. Like you, it, it helps you accomplish things not that you can accomplish things with when you're not working out of course people do that all the time but there's this powerful feeling that comes with it when you're also taking care of your body oh absolutely i think that especially because people men women in general we're getting more sedentary it seems like and the one thing the one form of exercise that seems to basically boost confidence, make you a little more resilient, get you ready for your day, get you more focused at work is getting your heart rate up, right? So yeah. cardiovascular endurance. So, you know, going for a run, going for a high speed walk, you know, you want to try to, you know, our, our government actually recommends to do five days a week, 30 minutes a day of moderate to high intensity exercise. All right. Mm -hmm. And it's cool. A lot of, not a lot of people know that, but that's a good kind of standard to go by. Like, if you get outside 30 minutes a day or inside or hop on a bike and get your heart rate up above like basically an easy calculation, if you take 220 minus your age, that's your max heart rate. Okay. okay. And then if you take, if you take your max heart rate and you take about 70, 60, 60 to 70% of that, try to push your heart rate up to that percentage. Oh, okay. I, I guarantee you're going to feel more clarity mentally. You're going to feel more like yourself. You're not going to feel as anxious, depressed. Your endorphins kick up, your cortisol drops, your, all of your internal bodily functions basically improve. Mm. So, you know, shoot for that five days, 30 minutes a day. And if you can't do five days, then split it up three days, you know, and just take that 150 minutes, split it up throughout the week. Can you do that? Is it a 30, like, can you do like 15 minutes at the beginning and end of the day, let's say, just because of time constraints and, and demanding schedules? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. You could do. It still yeah. has the same effect. Okay. Yeah. So as long as you get around 150 minutes a week, you know, you're going to feel, you're going to feel different in a positive way. Mm, that's so true. And getting outside while the weather's, weather's nice, especially, there's a lot of cool like studies on obviously sunlight, vitamin D. That boosts your mood, that boosts testosterone in males. It oh, also, I didn't know that. yeah, so getting sun, men's testosterone is the highest in the morning. So, mm. like, you know, ideally, yeah. if, you, <laughs> if you get out, yeah, if you get out in the morning, <laughs> get out in the morning, get some sunlight, go for a walk or run, you're getting wind on your face. The wind and the feeling of that air passing by you is also very therapeutic. That's why I say, you know, go on a bike ride, get a little more wind, you know, go for a run, get a little more wind. You have to get some sunshine and yeah, you're going to notice like significant differences. What are some of the other things like that with the whole testosterone thing that you said that you do with the competitive guys who want to get like, yeah. you know, cause I think, cause this is like a big thing too, that I get a lot of questions and, you know, and, and men that are dealing with even younger men that are dealing with erectile dysfunction. And I think it is connected to like no exercise. A lot of it, I think like overuse of porn is also part, you know, huge part of it. What do you like? What, so you said you, you recommend stuff like can you yeah, share with us <laughs> abso absolutely so the the main ones i typically recommend one good way is a cold plunge or cold water on your body so you know if you don't have like a, a submergent tank or you know access to a place that has it just take a cold shower all right so there's a lot of good studies on reducing your core body temperature after that your testosterone boosts up your internal body temperature heats up naturally. So studies for cold water submersion or cold water exposure, it says about three mm -hmm. minutes at a time for four days a week. So that's about, what's 12 minutes a week of some type of cold water exposure or submersion. So everybody typically has access to a shower, right? So right, go, in yeah, your, go, go in your shower and it's going to be not that enjoyable. Crank that sucker to cold, all right? I like yeah. to do it at the end. So I'll take a warm shower, then at the end, do like a minute of cold, right? 
and you're just standing there. And as you're getting cold, you're going to want to get out of it. You're going to be like, this sucks. Why am I doing this? But at this moment is when you do deep breathing and you kind of fight your inner demons and you say, hey, I got this. You know, it also pumps up your confidence a little bit. And as you work through the cold, you get better exposure to that and you kind of acclimate, you know, for the next time it's a little easier. Mm -hmm. But yeah, try to get 12 minutes a week, cold water exposure. And does it get easier? Does it get any, does it, because like I did that today because I, I, I was thinking to myself because I read a lot about this and people were recommended like, yeah. yeah. And, and so I said, okay, it's the summer if you're in the Northern hemisphere started. So this is the perfect time for me to do the cold. And so I've been doing it and actually I've only done it three days in a row. So I don't know if it's going to get better. Does it get, but does it like, does it feel less painful after a while? Oh, hundred percent. I live on Long Island. I'm about a mile from the sound. So I've been doing it almost every day and I was doing it through the winter months. You know, the water, the water was like, yeah, 39 degrees, 40 degrees, but it definitely gets easier and you don't feel, you know, like you want to get out. It's kind of a mental thing as well. Huh. You kind of get numb in a sense where you're like, you don't feel anything. Like literally numb. (laughs) Literally numb. Once you get numb, you're like, all right, I'm good. And then you get out. And you kind of feel your body get alive, your, your your eyes get wide, you feel more awake. And then there's a really cool increase in dopamine. You get about a 300% increase in dopamine basically immediately after, and it lasts for up to like 12 hours throughout wow. your day. So if you start your day with cold, you're, not only you're, you're, as a male, you're boosting your testosterone, and then female and male, you're boosting dopamine. And do- dopamine is a feel-good yeah. hormone. So a lot of times we get dopamine kicks, you know, from... Yeah, like making love, having sex, right? That's a good dopamine kick. What's crazy is gamblers get dopamine kicks when they gamble, when they hit hit a card or you know stuff like that. So there's there's positive dopamine kicks and there's negative, but the water submerge is definitely a positive one. Yeah, I see what you're saying about how you feel after, like accomplished. I also feel like the hair and the skin and everything, and and that's interesting. I didn't realize that it was a boost for that long because for people that suffer from ADHD, like I do, we're always like you know looking for ways to because it's, you know, it's like, we don't have as much dopamine as people who do, the people who don't have it. So for all of you out there, that's not from ADHD, for another yeah, reason. 100%. Testosterone from ADHD, like, you know, your confidence level, get out there and uh, get cold. Yeah, yeah, get cold, yeah. get cold. It's, it's awesome. Yeah. Uh, it, it's, it's really cool. Yeah, so then the next one is vitamin D. Vitamin D has been shown to improve testosterone kind of absorption and creation throughout the body. And, you know, you talk to your doctor, but you can talk about that, uh, how, how many milligrams it varies per person. Good vitamin D. You also got to find good supplements. There's a lot of bad supplements out there that aren't mm. tested well. So you want to find third-party tested company. Company I really mm. highly recommend is a company called Pure Encapsulations. They're third-party tested. Really good stuff. Mm. Uh, oh, wow. Thorn. Okay. Thorn is another good company, but those are the top two I usually recommend. And then also exercise, obviously. High intensity interval training specifically is going to boost yeah. your testosterone. And also heavy and lifting. And how does that work again? Sorry, I'm true. How does the, the workout is, because I do that a lot, like even when I'm biking and yeah. stuff. So it's like you get it up, your heart rate, it's based on heart rate and time. Can you share a little bit about that? Before yeah, heart rate, heart rate and time. Uh, easy example to understand is something called Tabata. So Tabata is a high intensity interval training workout. It lasts four minutes, okay? But it's like the hardest four minutes that you'll, you'll do. Like, so yeah. you can you can pick you can pick any movement you want to do. You can do push ups, squats. You can do jump jacks, burpees, whatever. But basically, you're going for 20 seconds on as hard as you can, 10 seconds rest. 20 seconds on as hard as you can, 10 seconds rest. You repeat that eight cycles. That's four minutes in time. And what that does is jacks your heart rate up in those 20 seconds, and then you drop down a little bit again. Then it jacks you back up again. So it's it's spiking your growth hormone a little bit. Mm. And when growth hormone goes up, testosterone goes up. And then it also spikes your cortisol a little bit. And then the come down of cortisol after that is very positive. So uh, mm. it, it releases endorphins as well. So there's a cool balance between cortisol, growth hormone, testosterone, Oxygen, obviously, in the cells expands your lungs a lot. So yeah, due to bodies, four minutes. I mean, okay. like, like if you're if you're a desk worker, you know, if you're if you don't like working out, simple, sit to stands, go in your chair, go up and down, twenty seconds, then te- ten seconds rest. Uh, you'll feel a lot better after that. Wow. That's a cool suggestion. Yeah. So there's longer high intensity interval training workouts, but that's like 
a short and quick, easy one to do. Yeah, especially for people who are just starting their workout journey or yeah. feel like, you know, I'm not, I'm not the kind of, in the, you know, they realize that we all can become whatever. We could just, we just have to go for it and start from somewhere. Yep, with absolutely. Everything, you know, we all have oh. our, our gifts and talents and then we all have our strengths and weaknesses. So if you feel that your weakness is that you're not athletic, well, you just got to work harder at it. You're probably your strengths or someone else's weaknesses and what comes easy to you might not come easy to them. So it's just about getting committed and doing it. Just do it. <laughs> just right? do it. Absolutely. Just do it. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Cool, cool. For sure. So let me ask you this, Drew. Thank you so much. Was there like anything that you can, around masculinity, the definition of masculinity, we touched on that a bit about the, your father. And the reason I was asking is because I, I feel that right now, I, I get this a lot, men need certain things and women are just not carrying it. And women need certain things, but men are just like believing that, no, that's not what it is. It's really something else. And it could be about in the communication. It could be like a lot of men think that women only want men that look a certain way, who have a certain kind of body, a certain you know bank account, a certain social status. But for those people out there that really, for those men out there who really truly believe that the only way they're going to be desired and wanted or find a partner or how they, why they should get out there and try is going to be if they have all of these things that I just described, right? I don't believe that because I know that's definitely not the case as a woman. I know that that's definitely not the case. There are reasons why some of those things could hold true in our programming just to survive as a species. What misconceptions do you think that men have about women and even women have about men? around masculinity around what it is to be a man what it is to what what men think about women in general mm, yeah i agree with you i don't I, I i don't agree with those things you were talking about as well i think a lot of times men especially men that were brought up to like always respect women and be a gentleman type thing some men that are brought up that way like don't want to hurt a woman's feelings or they have a hard time approaching a woman because Oh, she may think like my breath smells today or like, you know, I didn't put mm -hmm. deodorant on or she may not like or my I'm facial hair her. Or, yeah. or yeah, I'm coming at her too hard. Right. Because yeah. those men that try to be gentlemen sometimes are over gentlemanly like yeah. they don't want to disrespect a woman. I think that all women, they like, it seems like most women like to be approached by a man like it, who is a gentleman and who is nice and, and does show empathy. Those type of men, it's, it's just really hard for them because they think that those women, you know, immediately are going to judge them a certain way. But I, I think that's a misconception that, you know, men have to get out of their heads. Yeah. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, yeah. women I, I, are looking for people like humor and someone who's confident. And a lot of times, those sometimes the most confident guys don't check all those boxes that these other guys who are in their head think right. they have to check, right? Right, right. I mean, definitely. Yeah, but then when you try to tell men that, they, they're like, no, 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 but this is what it is. And it's like, yeah, you're right. There are some women that only want to talk to those guys. That's, that, that's true. But for the most part, that's not the case, you know? Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And what do you recommend for those guys like that think that way that that are the nice guy because they don't really take a more direct approach while still maintaining that they're gentlemen and get back? See, that's what's really cool about you. And I'm sure Teresa would totally agree. That's why she married you. Yeah. Like you have a good balance because you're like masculine, but then you also you're a gentleman, but you're also like you have good communication skills. You you're, you have empathy, you have compassion, and you can sense that. But at the same time you're masculine. So how do you do that? Like, how does that yeah. balance occur? Like, how did you create that? It maybe it stems from like my desire to want to help people like all the time. Like I always want to, yeah, be empathetic towards people because everybody goes through certain things. Right. They're, everybody's dealing with something in their life. And yeah, I come at every communication that I have or every, every conversation kind of with empathy. Mm. And I try to be confident in a way that's like not overpowering but it's it's like kind of comforting to somebody yeah. you know to, to show them that hey i'm listening you know i'm a good support for you you know let me let me hear what you have to say i'll try to relate to that some in some way so you feel a comfort and then kind of once you break that barrier then the current kind of opens up and then you know i just be myself i show that i have a sense of humor in a way that i think you know, people tend to laugh at me a lot just because I say, <laughs> so I, I just say things that are on my mind and I try to be 
I just try to be myself, but I get laughed at a lot, but it, it's in a, it's in a good way, I think. Um, yeah, yeah, because, yeah. You're just you really know, open, open, yeah, like yeah. authentic. You're very authentic. Yeah. You're like, and I think that like inspires others. I always say like, it's like your authenticity, even though you think it's going to be judged, you will be surprised. Yes, it'll be judged by a couple of people. But for the most part, your authenticity will inspire others to be able to be authentic as well. Yeah, I think, yeah, you nailed it. I think that's it. It's cool because, you know, when talking to somebody, you can kind of read them and understand where they're coming from, like pretty much immediately. And then I try to like meet them where they're at with that. And I think that, mm -hmm. you know, when it comes to dating, I think that, yeah, guys that want to be a gentleman, which, which we all should be, I mean, you know, we, yeah. we, we need to treat each other, especially women, like, you know, how they should be in a respectful way. I think that by approaching that situation that way, it just breaks down barriers. It makes, uh, it makes the conversation feel safe. And then you can just be yourself and you can joke around. But I think, I think humor is really important. And like, you don't have to be like a comedian, but you have to, I think, make people laugh in a certain way. Because laughter, right. obviously, you know, makes you feel comfortable. Right. It disarms. You know? It disarms. Yeah. And for men, I, this is what I always try to explain. Like, even if you're in... A relationship like a woman feeling safe is like our default program you know yeah so we default to that just like you guys default to like not looking weak or not you know like right. always being strong and so we default to being safe like it's a survival thing so i think like you nailed it when you said making us feel safe i think that if we can feel safe and just how better to feel safe is when we are standing in front of a man who's being authentic because we know like you know, instead of saying, like, what does this person want from me? Like, why, you know, it comes from a place like, oh, there's something about this person that feels safe. Why? Because they're being authentic. And yes. like you said, humor, just, you know, sometimes just sharing that you went through something that you had a shitty day. How was yours? Like, you know, can get people going too because everybody goes, oh, good. Thank you. How are you? You know, and it's I just know, like I bullshit. Know. Like, you're not always having a good day. Like, just be no. honest. Like, I had a fucked up day today. Yeah. Um, but you know what it is, you know, and, and try to joke around about it, that or something. So, because I do Absolutely. feel that so many men are in their heads a lot. And, you know, how do you get them on the court? How do you get them living life, you know, not sitting in the stands, but being on the court? That's usually the analogy I use with clients. It's like, you know, you're living over here watching the game. And yeah, it's fun, you know, whatever. But if you're on the court, that means you're really into in life. You know, you're really going after what you want. You're really going for it. You're making shots that don't go in. Like, you know, that that sometimes you lose the game. Sometimes, but you are a player in the game. You're not sitting in the stands watching it. So this is what I try to push and encourage my clients to do. At least one thing a day that gets you in the game. Yeah. Yeah, stay in the game. Then once you're in the game, you know, you kind of make play, you change your plays on the run. Like, you know, if like, yeah. you know, you need, you need a little more defense, a little more offense, you get after it. Yeah. You know, I think that, I think, yeah, that's a good, that's a good analogy. You know, as I'm thinking, like, I'm also thinking that some guys feel like girls like the bad boys, you know, like. Oh, like, yeah, that's a misconception too, right? right, right. Yeah, I don't know if that's true, but. You, you see it sometimes in movies, like, oh, the girls, like, oh, they fall for the bad guys. And, like, you know, you got to be, like, you got to do something that isn't, you know, within the norm or isn't, like, a gentleman. But I think that's BS and, you know. Assholes, right? Like, yeah, like, like assholes. Yeah, like, to be yeah. an asshole. But I don't, I don't know how I feel about that. I just, I just I've never no. been that way myself as a man. But, um, you know, I know some guys try to put, put on that front. And I, I think, think that, that comes right. off very fake. And I think, you know, a good a good girl can see that. A good woman can see that. Usually the one, the women who like assholes, it's because they also need to work on themselves, which is fine. We're all on a journey, you know? Yeah. So usually you're attracted to that because you, there's something within you that you need to experience so that you can maybe have a moment where you decide like, hey, you know what? I need to work on myself. So right. I always say that I'm like, oh, they like assholes. Like women like, okay, yeah, we don't like nice guys in the sense we like kind guys. Because nice guys, usually there's an agenda behind their niceness. It's about them. And when you're with a kind guy, you could see their generosity. Like I always watch how men behave with other people. And if I see mm. that they're kind with others, that for me makes me feel safe. It makes me feel like I'm attracted to that masculine. And nice guys are the ones that like they do things because they have an agenda. It's not. It's really more about them than it is about the other person. And as women, we can smell that. So mm. I think that the clear thing is not that we like assholes, like like you said, good girls that are quality are going to know that are not no thank you to the asshole because that's so fake. And you can tell like, oh, that guy has 
like we all have insecurities, but there's something going on there. If he, that's like the, the role he plays, right? Right. And we liked kind eyes. Like I always observe the way the other people treat, like men treat other people. It says a lot about mm. and people in general, I think. And I think that's where men get confused with kind and nice and assholes and all that stuff, you know? Yeah. I like how you put it nice versus kind. I never thought of it that way, but you know, being kind is more like you see them in the act doing that, being that genuine self of who they are. Yeah. That's pretty cool. That's yeah. And cool. it's about others, you know, you're not like, yeah. like a, a guy will do something nice because he expects to get some sort of attention or some sort of whatever in return. And when he doesn't get it, then he might be passive aggressive. You know, and that's usually all based out of insecurities. But if the guy is grounded in his kindness, that's why it's attractive to women. And that's why, because, of, you know, it connects to the safety thing that we look, look for. And also it just, it's like, it's masculine because you're like, wow, this person goes out in the world and like cares about people and takes care of people, which is what is really what the masculine energy that we, mm. that allows us to really be in our feminine energy. Mm. Yeah. Interesting. What about women, like, as far as being attracted to men, like, sometimes you hear, like, oh, like, women like the dad bod now. And then, like, oh, women like, uh, you know, guys with six packs or, like, you know, guys that are six feet tall and, and over. Like, what do you say about that or what do you know about that? Yeah, so there's actually interesting studies out there that prove that men have this ideal, like, they call them chads now, of what women find attractive, right? A super chiseled face, a six pack, over six yeah. feet right physically right yeah but the reality is that yes while there are some women attracted to that when they did the study they showed that women were not necessarily att as attracted or in some kind of cases not attracted at all to the men that men thought that they would be attracted to mm. right and also women have just like men have taste women have tastes and for example like i like really smart guys right so mm -hmm. I don't care the type or the, you know, the ethnic map or whatever. If someone is really intelligent, it, for me, it's it's a turn on, you know, like I like it. Mm -hmm. So for some women, it's guys in glasses. They sound like weird things, but that women do like that. And I feel like if men could lean into those things more instead of wanting to be broadly attractive to what they think is broadly attractive to everyone just lean into like your special gifts just like men also have weird quirks about things they like that's in certain women like women and you'll be like oh really you like that like that's such a weird you know and you're like okay thank you that's <laughs> a i never noticed that before about myself but i think that men have this idea and that goes back to what we were saying before about like what men really need what men really want what women really need what women really want and there's this huge breakdown in that communication and we're telling you as women like we want someone that makes us feel good like i think in general that's people in general right we yeah. want people who make us feel good who make us feel seen who make us feel heard who appreciate us who you know who are affectionate because that connection is important as well who you know are authentic because they allow us to be authentic. So lean into whatever gift that you have. And it, even if you have a dad bod, if you're a really fun, cool guy, and I know girls who have said they're attracted to the dad bod. Mm -hmm, I mm -hmm. know women that say, I do not like guys with muscles. I have a girlfriend that likes really skinny guys with big noses. <laughs> and yeah. she's very yeah and she's very attractive right and so you will if you just yeah if you can get out of your head for a second and just get into you know what is special about me and just go with it and what i say to women here is like don't be so stingy with your compliments ladies like compliment men you know men remember the compliments you give them because i like to compliment you know because i like to be complimented but as women we're kind of used to it men don't really get that and so if you do get compliments to other guys, most likely they're 100% genuine. So lean into whatever that compliment was about you and, and really embrace it. And even if it sounds like counterintuitive to what you believe women like, that's not the case. And you'll find those women who are into whatever it is that your dad bod, maybe I know girls that like bald guys. I know girls who like guys with big eyebrows, What you know, whatever, <laughs> you know, yeah, it yeah. is. At the end of the day, we like men that make us feel safe. And then we have our, you know, our little quirks about physical stuff, but voices, like some women are into like guys with vo their voice, you know? Yeah. It's, it's a whole it's variety. Nice. Yeah, yeah. 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 But the best thing is if you get out there and you can kind of just play with it, lean into it, but also connect, right? You're not going to find any, of, you're not going to find those women who like your quirkiness or whatever it is that you have, unless you're out there on the court connecting having conversations and i always say just have conversations like a friend like 
that's the best way to make a woman feel safe. Like you're just coming at her, like you're having a human conversation. hundred percent. That's funny you say that because we, my wife and I, we just had uh we got a, a little getaway for anniversary uh, in oh, yeah, Florida. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. you know, it was just, it was just yeah. me and her with, with no kids, but it was awesome because it brought me back to how I see her as my best friend, you know, cause we, mm. we were just talking like, we did like when we started dating college and it was awesome because we don't really have those moments much, but connecting on that level as like a best friend, it's like the easiest, yeah. like funnest, like kind of like freeing experience. Cause you just feel like yourself, you don't have to hold anything back, you know? So I think, yeah, if you can find a good partner like that, that makes you feel like, you know, that kind of that talks to that person, like your friend brings a lot of comfort yeah. and, you know, makes the conversation go better. And yeah, it, yeah, it, that's awesome. I think that's, that's key. Yeah. It's like, you want to find someone that's like a friend and then like your partner in crime, you know, I always say this, find yeah. your partner in crime, you know? Exactly. But the only exactly. way you can do that is by being yourself and being authentic and, and you'll attract, right. It's for me, it's like a vibrational thing. You, you know that because you're very much about energy. And I right. feel like when you're authentic, no matter what that is, you give off that vibe you're going to allow others to feel and be authentic because you open up the space for them. But then you also mm -hmm. start attracting the people who have the same kind of values as you, the views, the, 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 and unless you're having open and honest conversations, like how are you ever going to find that best friend slash partner in crime? Absolutely. Yeah. Cause then you're not, you're, you're not, you're holding back from who you are and then you're not sharing, yeah. you're not accepting, you're not receiving, you know, what, what the conversation should be like. Yeah. I think, yeah. Just being, being like you said, authentic and true to yourself and then true to that person being empathetic and understanding where they're coming. That's key. Right. 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 So, yeah. yeah. And just yeah. put the energy, good energy out there. I think like that's what you do, which I know it's draining working with people physically, you know, cause you absorb their energy. I'm guessing, right? Like, do you feel mm. depleted after a long, like working physically on people all day or how does that work out for you? Yeah, I did. When I first started the hands-on manual therapy work, like I was seeing 20 patients a day and I was getting home at like six o'clock at night and I would basically just go to bed. I wouldn't even eat dinner. I was exhausted. And a couple of weeks in, I was like, I can't do this forever. I don't know how I'm going to keep this up. And then I realized that I was taking these emotions home with me that these people were sharing with me because people share a lot when they're in pain and it gets pretty intense with some people. But as I progress through my career, I'm coming up on 10 years doing it. I've now learned to just basically separate it. So as soon as I step out of an appointment with a patient, like I leave that patient in that room on that table, right? And with everything we said, I kind of, I keep it separate. Then I move on to the next patient. And then by the end of my day, after my last patient, I try to leave it all there. Cause if I bring it home, then I'm not a good husband. I'm not a good father. I'm not a good friend because I'm taking on those emotions. It can be heavy on the heart, but you can't block right. it all. You definitely feel exhausted. It'll do some days, but it's because I'm doing right. manual work. I'm using my hands. I'm using my body. You, we all are human and we absorb people's mm -hmm. emotions. And because I tap into the energy, I'm giving my energy to them. I'm also listening right. to their energy. So it's a real thing, but I'm definitely more, uh, I, I can do this for a long more, a lot more time because of the techniques that I change. I change the way I use my body and I change the way that I kind of put up a wall when it comes to emotions. I've had to deal with people that have told me they want to kill themselves. You know, I have, that, that's a really tough, uh, yeah, tough session to have, too. you know, so, yeah, you know, I've seen all types of emotions, but yeah, it's, it, like I said, we're, we're both people that want to help people. It's easy for us to take that on. So we just, you know, at the end of the day, take care of yourself, you know? Right, yeah. right, right. Yeah. And I guess that's yeah. advice that even people who don't work with others, like in any kind of mm -hmm. space of, you know, healing or coaching or anything, taking care of yourself is so key, you know, eating yeah. well, sleeping, dancing, having fun, like just whatever that is for you, you know, being with your pet. But I think definitely getting out of your comfort zone, I think for all of us is really important too, in terms of adding to that list of taking care of yourself, even though it sounds like you're abusing yourself by doing it. But the reality is stepping out of your comfort zone, you start to discover things about yourself that you really didn't, wouldn't know unless you change things up a bit, you know? Oh, yeah. I think being in a, being in discomfort is what people are lacking, especially mm -hmm. men. You know, I think because you, that's how you grow. Like you have to have a little discomfort, I think in a, in a daily situation, like small dosages, right? Because yeah. like, you know, if you can work through discomfort, the rest of your day is going to be good. Right. So right. if, if your day is filled with just feeling good all the time and, you know, 
doing things that are easy, I mean, you're not really going to grow in my opinion. I think yeah. you got to put yourself through some discomfort. I do that through my workouts. My workouts are really intense and they suck. And it's like, why am I doing this to myself? <laughs> oh. But, but when I'm, when I'm done, I'm like, yes, I conquered that. Like I did yeah. that. It, it was terrible, but Hey, you know, I may have failed. I may have done some things wrong, but you know, listen, I got out of this. That's a win for the day. And then the rest of my day is like, great, you know, and it doesn't right. matter what time of day I do that. It could be at the end of my day, you know, the, the, and your whole day kind of drags on. You hit a hard workout. You feel good after you conquer something. Mm -hmm. So that's my discomfort. I put myself through and you can't avoid discomfort. You got to try to work into it. Like you said, and that's how you yeah. gotta grow. Embrace so, it. That's embrace what I would it. say. Embrace it. Like rejection yeah. and all of those things are your friend. And I think, you know, I, I, one person wrote me once and said like, oh, so I'm just supposed to get rejected over and over again. Forget that. And I'm thinking, actually, yes, because that is life. You are going to have disappointments and rejections and things that happen, but it builds character. It builds grit. It builds like, especially I think, I mean, for women and men, but I think for men, especially this, this feeling of having to be accomplished and doing hard things is good for all of us, but I think it's especially crucial for men and i think you're absolutely right men are avoiding taking the easier way out it's a lot easier to reach your porn than it is to make a connection and try to talk to people and maybe get rejected but at the end of the day the easy way out ends up keeping you further away from the the thing that you know the human brain is the only organ that needs someone else to survive all of our other organs just depend on us and our systems but our mind you know, we're living in a world where, yeah, technically we don't need anybody because we can order food. We can, yeah. you know, masturbate on our stomach by ourselves. We can, you know, whatever. But we cannot, like, cheat ourselves on connection. Mm. Connection is powerful, you know. And um, and I guess that's where we could close up. Is there any suggestion, since you are so amazing at connecting and your gift is giving people that through their healing them, but it's also, I think, the power of your touch and connection. Is there anything that you could suggest? that would be key to make us as men and women, as men connecting to themselves, as just the world being more connected. Do you have any special magical <laughs> suggestions? <laughs> Up your sleeve. Yeah. <laughs> I know, I know. Yeah, well, yeah I'm lucky because I, I do the manual therapy hands-on work. So I'm connecting, you know, physically with people. I'm helping them heal. But yeah, not everybody can do that. You know, I think just face-to-face -to -face with somebody you know, is, is awesome. Meeting up with people face to face and being connected, like disconnected from your phone, put away distractions, talk somebody, look them in the eyes. Eye contact's really mm. important. And then showing yeah. them that, that, that you're open and you're listening. And I think a lot of times within my practice, like you have to learn how to be an active listener. And what I mean by yes. that is, you know, is like not only like shaking your head, shaking your head's good. You're, you're, you're engaged, you're acknowledging, but like, asking questions back to let the person know that you're hearing them and what the topic is that they're talking about. Relate those questions to that topic. And active listening is like super therapeutic, super helpful, rather than like thinking of the next thought immediately about what, you, what you're going to say, you know, before you say it type of thing. And yeah, I think a lot of people, if they focus on being present in each moment, even if you are like on your own in your house, like behind your computer, like look at where you are in that present moment think of how you feel like if you don't feel like you're getting a lot out of the situation switch to something else you know get up walk out of the room call a friend say hey you want to meet up let's meet let's meet face to face and yeah like give hugs to people that you love you know i think yeah uh, a lot a lot of people they don't look at the power of a hug or just like a handshake you know like mm -hmm. a good handshake right don't give somebody a, a limp hand. <laughs> it's just not a, yeah, it's not, it's not a good look for you. And then for that person, you know, they don't feel like you're engaged with them and, and you're welcome. So little things like that, I guess. A smile, but, right? I always uh, say smile. Like yeah. a smile is, a, I always say it's the best accessory, you know. Smiles are amazing, smile. you know. Mm. Yeah. And, and we lose that, I think, a little bit in society because you see everybody on their phones a lot. But, right. you know. Try to try to step away from that. You know, I, I talked to a, another younger dad. This was like when Grace was born, my daughter, and he's always on his phone a lot for his work. And one day, like we were talking, he was like, dude, I just said, fuck my phone one day. And I just threw it to the side because I was so disconnected. And I was just like sitting there on my phone while my daughter was playing with her toys. 
and I just lost all connection. So, you know, I, that really stuck in my head because now mm -hmm. I, I really I try to put my phone away when I'm with my kids mm -hmm. uh, because, yeah, that human to human connection is so important and we cannot lose it as a society. I think that we need to mm -hmm. make more physical connections one on one because it's just going to create for a happier, more engaged, socially accepting in you know society so yeah i encourage people to get out face to face good hugs good handshakes smile yeah. look them in the eyes you know yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. instead of being yeah. guarded i feel like so many people like you know an example i was at the dentist yesterday and a girl dropped something and i i picked it up and i handed it to her not that it's like i did such a great thing but she didn't even like look in my eyes she just went thank you and i thought i, I had a pure comp compassion for her because i thought wow, that was an opportunity, like, not that we were going to, like, become best friends or anything was going to happen, but it's just, like, you know, someone was showing love at the moment. And I do, I'm not attached to the outcome, so I don't, I didn't get mad or first. And I just thought, wow, she's so disconnected. She was there with the phone hunched over, you know, like, her spine is all he says. Yeah. And it was a moment for her to kind of step out of it. But I feel like people are so disconnected and I, and that just led me to believe that she's and i thought wow she must be really disconnected to herself and anytime that we're really disconnected to ourselves like it's not it's not good it's a small example we have a moment to hold a door open for someone to, to yeah. look around and if you see an elder person struggling with the door hold the door open or a mother with a stroller trying to get in or anything just but you can only do that if you are out there paying attention and I think that that's what my suggestion would be. Just pay more attention, you know, and people will start paying more attention. And the, the the universe has a way of giving it back to you, to give it back to you, that energy and everything. And I just, that's why I, I always say, like, connection is just so powerful. So thank you, Drew. I, I agree 100%. Yeah, no, thank you. This has been awesome. Yeah, it's always so much fun, you know, with you. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's it's just always good to talk to you. Like, you know, it's just, it's easy. And uh, yeah, it comes from a place of love, I think, and want to help others. And yeah, I think keep doing what you're doing. I think it's great. You know, it's very powerful. Other men connect with each other and with the right relationship that they're trying to find or whatever, even if it's like, you know, simple tips and advice. I think it's, it's really important to know that you're out thank there. You. So thank you for what thank you do. You. Yeah. Like, thank you for what yeah. you do. Seriously. I mean, you changed my whole, you know, like I was suffering and in pain. And then on top of it, I feel like I made a new friend. And yeah. and what you do now, I get to share with others that, you know, could benefit from it tremendously. Because I, I know I did. So thank you. Oh, from the bottom of my heart. I love doing yeah. it. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thank you so That's much. Good. So everyone, thank you for being here. We're going to link all the stuff in the, we'll link it below. Anything about, you know, definitely what the title of what, Drew does maybe a couple of the supplements. We don't have any kind of a uh, endorsing or anything. It's just us sharing, you know, something that could be helpful for you on your journey. And thank you. And remember, the world needs you.